Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Today, we're going to be learning all about maple syrup with our expert, Ron Roberts, Jr. I'm Laura Carlo, the WCRB morning announcer and today's GBH host for this event. Thank you to everybody who joined in today, including our Leadership Circle and Ralph Lowell Society members. We really appreciate your continued support. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that unlike us, you will not be on video and we won't even be able to hear you, but we do want to know what your questions are. If you have a question that you would like to ask our expert, you have to open the Q&A tab right at the bottom of your screen and then just type it in. As always, we'd love to know from where you are viewing this event. So when you submit your question, please let us know. And if you see a question that you would really like to have answered, give it a thumbs up because that'll move it right to the top. I mean, technology is amazing these days. Uh, also, to turn on the closed captioning feature, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options are going to open up for you. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your viewing screen. You can also select full transcript and then a sidebar window will open up where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that a closed captioning might be slightly delayed. Well, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to our expert today, Ron Roberts, Jr. Ron Roberts Jr. is the Director of Operations along with his wife, Tanya Roberts at Parker's Maple Barn in Mason, New Hampshire. He is also, listen to this title, Chief Sugar Maker. That has to be the best job in the world. The Roberts family has owned and operated this destination restaurant, sugar house and gift shop uh, for, many, many years, um, including uh, when they bought it from the Parker family that started the operation in the 1960s. Ron Roberts began maybe, uh, making maple sugar when he was just 15 years old, mentored by the late Terry Dennehy of Brookline, New Hampshire, and he continues to produce maple syrup in the same sugar house every March. He'll even get a helping hand from his wife, Tanya, and their two children when the sap starts a running. So Ron, welcome to our Ask the Expert today. Thank you, Laura. Very happy to be here. I'm so glad that we get to do this because I love anything sweet and maple sugar is right up there at the top of the list. Me so with, with the title Chief Sugar Maker, I mean, that's a title that mm -hmm. I would only be able to dream about. <laughs> what is the best thing about your job? Well, God, it's a lot. I mean, I love going out in the woods this time of year and, you know, tapping the trees, gathering the sap. Uh, you know, typically when you're gathering sap, the weather is, you know, it's it's not frigid. It's usually above 32 degrees and there's a, there's a nice breeze sometimes. Today, it's been super windy, but I'm um, just being out there in the woods with the fresh air and you're emptying buckets filled with sweet water. It's just, it doesn't get any better than that. Wow. All right. So how many trees and taps are we talking about? Well, our operation, we do just under 2,000 taps each winter. Uh, sounds like a lot, but uh, there are other producers that have tens of thousands of taps. So we are relatively a smaller producer, but um, we, we, we get about, yeah, about 2,000 taps that we put out. And then most of those taps are on other people's property. Wow. That's so it's a community event, really. It really is. Yeah. People love, they love when I bang on their door every year and say, I'm here to tap your trees and they they get excited and they like, they like watching. Sometimes they help. It's really, it is a community event. What a wonderful, wonderful picture you just painted for us. Well, I know that our participants today have lots of questions for you too. And I think we should get right to those questions. Uh, Jack is with us today. He asks, how important is the tap location on the tree relative to height from the ground, relative to rising and setting sun, relative to previous taps from previous years? So height from the ground, not important. You could tap a branch that's over your head and you'll get sap. You could tap two inches from the ground and you get sap. We tend to, the rule of thumb is 
um, we usually go about waist high. So if you're this, this year, we were standing on a little bit of ice as we were tapping the trees. There've been years where we, when you tap at waist high, but you're standing on three feet of crusty snow, when it comes time to take the trees down, the buckets are now you know, over some people's heads and they're thinking, why did you tap so high? Well, we were standing on all that snow. So it really doesn't matter where you tap. As far as old holes, you, you don't wanna tap directly above or directly below an old tap hole. There'll be a little bit of dead wood around that area. So scar tissue, so to speak. So you won't get uh, as good uh, sap flow. So you just try to, you can go above or below at a much greater distance and not be worried about the, the hitting the, the dead wood. So um, that's pretty much there, um, what, what you have to do to tap the tree. All right, Mike, uh, Mike is listening today and he asks, how much is climate change affecting New Hampshire maple syrup productivity? We're finding that sugar season seems to come earlier and earlier each season. Uh, so I think that that is, you know, it's causing the, you know, the, the, the snow starts to melt a little bit sooner. Typically, when you have nice snow cover, the snow around the bases of the trees kind of keeps the trees insulated, keeps the sap down in the roots. And then once you start getting warm days, uh, the, the, the sun warms up the bark of the tree, causing a basically a ring of melted snow around the base of each tree. And when we see that ring of melted snow, we know that the, the bark is warmed up enough to kind of wake up the sap that's underground in the roots. But we are definitely finding that the last three or four seasons of we've been able to tap the trees a lot sooner than we used to when, and when I was a kid. So Has that I'll just do a quick follow-up. Has that affected uh, the amount of sap that you're getting? Sometimes it does. So the, the season starts a little sooner and then it tends to get warmer sooner um, toward the end of the season. So it, warm weather is, you don't want too much warm weather. An ideal sugar season would be every night down in the low to mid twenties and every day from 32 to maybe 40 degrees. Those are the ideal temperatures. But when we get days like the last two days where it hit 60 degrees for two days in a row and it didn't freeze up at night, that's, that, that's not good. It kind of tricks the trees into believing that spring is here. And then the, 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 the buds on the tips of the branches will start eating the, the sugar so they can become leaves. So it kind of speeds up the whole season and which makes for less, you know, less time for us to make, make, sap, uh, make syrup from the sap. Oh, that's really interesting. All right, Jerry has a question for us. He said, is there something like terroir for maple syrup? In other words, can you detect taste differences between syrup from Maine versus syrup from New Hampshire, for example? I don't believe so, but some people can detect different differences in the flavor of the sap. So there are many different species of maple. Uh, we try to tap mostly sugar maples because a sugar maple will give you sap that's sweeter than all of the other maples. But we do also tap some red maples, some Norway maples, some silver maples. And other than uh, the sugar content being different, some people say they can taste a, a, little, a little bit of different flavor in sap that comes from a red maple or a swamp maple versus a sugar maple. But I've never noticed any difference in flavors between the states. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, we're all, we're all good. Oh, yeah, we're all real good. <laughs> All right, so David is asking a question about how long after collecting should the sap be boiled? Well, that depends on the temperature of where you are storing the sap. So when you start getting, um, if you start getting really warm days, the sap will rapidly ferment. So if we, and that usually doesn't happen until the end of the season, but days like the last two days where you have sap that's sitting perhaps in your sugar house in a tank and it's 55, 60 degrees for two, two days in a row and then you get a couple of nights that don't go below freezing, the sap will start to ferment. So sap is, I, I kind of equate it to like milk. It's something that you can't just leave it on the countertop during warm weather and expect it, the quality is still going to be there. So when we bring our sap in, we try to cook it right away, usually within 24 hours. But then when we start getting those really warm temperatures where the sap is no longer at a refrigerator temperature below 41 degrees, we, yeah, we just, we cook it as quick as we can. Okay, but now I have to do another follow-up. Sure. When milk ferments, we get cheese. When mm. maple syrup ferments, or when maple sap ferments, what happens? It, it, you get ooze. And it's, and it's not good ooze. I know some people think, well, it must ferment and turn into like a maple wine or a maple, like a hard cider. Not at all. Uh, there are yeasts that are in the air when the weather starts to get warmer and these yeasts um, attack the sugars in the, in the syrup and turn it into almost a milky, gooey substance that does not smell good and does not taste good. 
So yes, um, fermented sap, sour sap is something that you, you don't want to eat or drink or do anything with. Yeah, I think yeah. the name sour sap said it all. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Chuck has a question for us. Uh, he's from Guilford, Vermont, by the way. And he said, in my effort to save firewood, I've been allowing my collected sap buckets to freeze and skimming off the ice. Due to a cold snap, my buckets are 90% frozen and I've drained off a small amount of sap. Is it worth cooking down any of the sap water that is frozen? Or can I assume I got most of the good stuff? You got all the good stuff. We call that super sap. And when, so when the sap freezes, uh, sap is typically about 98% water. So it's a very small percentage of, of, um, of sugar in sap. To about, about two and a half percent is about average uh, sugar content for sap. And we've even seen that go down through the years. But um, when you freeze it, what you're freezing in, in essence is just the water and the sap that's underneath that. If you were to check the, the, the sugar content of that sap, it might have been two and a half percent when it was a full bucket, but that sap at the bottom is probably it could be three, four or five percent sugar. So it will take you a lot less of that sap that's left at the bottom to, to make a one gallon of syrup. So I wouldn't bother melting down the frozen bucket shaped ice cubes. OK, Nancy is uh, with a question and she says, uh, do bears like maple syrup? And if so, do they damage lines? If not, why not? We've never had any bear damage. Uh, it seems that it's smaller creatures. It is chipmunks and squirrels. They love to chew the lines. I think they well, they see they see something in the woods that is different than everything else, all the trees, because the tubing lines, sometimes the color would be purple or a bright green. Um, and I, I think it's more out of curiosity. They, they chew into it because, hey, look at that. That looks tasty. And then when the sap starts squirting out in their face, they're like, OK, guys, party time. Let's go over here. And deer, deer will also be known to, to chew at the lines or sometimes if a herd were to come through, they might even just plow right through the lines and knock them off the, off the trees. So yeah, bears, I've not, we don't have a lot of bears around here, although we do have some. It's not like honey. They're, you know, a bear that might be attracted to honey. The sap that is in, out, out there in the woods, it doesn't smell like syrup. It doesn't taste like syrup. It just has such a sl slight sweetness to it that it's not really noticeable to a, a bear, I would think. Uh, um I'm going to do a PS on your comment about squirrels. Yeah. I noticed that your um, your store website has squirrel shaped dog treats. Yes. And and my dog loves barking at squirrels, so I'm I'm coming for those dog treats. We'll save you some. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, Anne has a question for you. She says, "Can all types of maple trees be tapped?" Yes. Any type of maple tree uh, will, will be producing sap during sugar season. It just, it's the sugar maples that will give you the sweetest sap. So they, if you're doing it for fun at home, you know, tap any kind of maple tree that you have, you'll just, you may end up with sap that's gonna, you're just gonna need more of it if it's from a Norway or a silver or a red maple. Uh, the sugar maple, we have one big old sugar maple on the property, we call her Mabel. Mabel the maple. And um, we always tap her every year and we always segregate her sap from all the rest of the sap because we like to just test it just to see. And we, so we get sap from 1700 to 2000 taps that are out there and it's mostly sugars, but a combination of the other maples. And if the sap comes in on a particular load at 2%, we always grab the bucket from Mabel and she'll be at three and a half or 4%. So it's a big difference, you know, to go from two to 4%. It's just, it's a lot less sap that you need to cook to get to the finished product. You know, you sound like a wine um, yeah. maker, you know, with the, the testing what comes from what barrel. Now you're talking yeah. about what comes from what bucket. Right. Yeah. Um, one of our attendees didn't give a name said, how do you figure out timing to tap? Think of the crazy weather this year. Uh, 20 degrees Monday, 60 degrees this morning. Yeah. So I rely heavily on the, the weather app on my iPhone. <laughs> I basically just look at the extended forecast and I know the weathermen aren't always famous for being right on the money, but if I see a warming trend coming um, where I see the, the warm days and the nights below 32, that's basically how I kind of will plan the, the time to tap the trees. In the old days, it was always right around Valentine's Day is when you go out and start tapping, but now it's, it's tending to be a little bit sooner than that. So you can't just go based on the old, uh, you know, go, go out at Valentine's Day. Uh, Lori from Millis 
other than the size of the tree? What factors make some trees flow more than others? The health of a tree. Um, if, if, if it's a good, healthy tree, it, it may produce more sap, uh, depending on uh, where, where the tree is located, uh, trees by a stream or in a, in a maybe swampy or wet area in the woods will tend to have more sap because they're able to get at more water to pull up through the roots. Um, yeah, so it really, it, it, it depends on a, a couple different factors like that, but um, I, I can't say that it's, a, it's really a location of the tree rather than the, the species of maple. Okay, that's great. Um, David asks, uh, boiling outside <clears throat> or on an open fire, what temperature should I boil to if I finish it in my house on the stove? Well, it'll be, depend on the atmospheric pressure of the day, and um, but on average, it's somewhere between about 219 degrees Fahrenheit to 221 degrees Fahrenheit. It really varies um, based on really where you are located, where you're boiling, how far above sea level you are. So, but it's in that range. What it, a good way to know is when you're looking at the syrup that's boiling in your pot, when the bubbles on top of the sap or that is almost syrup get to be about the size of a half dollar. So the bubbles will be very small and rapid, but when they start to really swell up and get really big, that's usually an indication that you're there. And you could dip something in that has a, like, like a ladle, something that you could dip into the syrup and lift up out of the syrup. And when it starts forming sheets, rather than dripping off like brown water, it'll actually drip off in clear, not clear, but like really thin sheets, almost like amber colored glass. When you see that sheeting, you know it's time to take it off the fire. Okay, Kathy's with us from Hampton, New Hampshire, and she said, how do you identify which maple trees are the best ones for tapping? The best time to identify that is in the summertime. You look for trees that have a very nice big crown, lots of leaves, and you, you want to look for sections of trees where there's dieback. You don't, there's a tree that was perhaps struck by lightning or a, a large branch had broken off. There's a good chance that there's going to be some sap that's going to be lost from that, that wound in the tree. So I'd like to look at all my trees in the summer and I can tell a tree that's healthy based on those factors versus going out this time of year where none of the trees have any leaves. It's hard to know how healthy a tree is. So, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. It's a summertime project too. Uh, Priscilla has a question for you. She said, I tried recreating Little House Maple Sugar Candy by pouring hot syrup in the snow for my grandkids and it didn't work. How is this done? So you basically, you heat, you have to heat maple syrup up to about 235 degrees. Um, so what you're doing is you are you're basically, you're taking maple syrup and you're heating it to a point so that when you pour it on the snow, it's going to form a taffy. If you just take hot maple syrup, let's say right out of that pot, as soon as it hits maple syrup at a, let's say, let's call it 220 degrees and you pour it into the snow, it's going to go straight down through the snow and just keep going until it hits the ground. Cause it's, it, um, it's, it's not the right consistency. You need to, you needed to have boiled off a little bit more water so that when you pour it over the snow, it'll just start to sink into the snow, but then it'll start to stop and it'll turn into a, a taffy and you can actually roll it on a spoon or a popsicle stick and then it stays as a, a gooey taffy. Yeah, I, my mother used to do that with us when we were little. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we did all kinds of crazy things with the snow, but I remember her saying it has to get to taffy stage before yeah. you can, before you can, uh, so your best she, bet is she wouldn't let us do it though, because she said it's too hot for the children. Oh so. yeah. It's super hot. and can definitely burn you. So your best bet is to have a candy thermometer and just go to softball, the softball stage on a candy thermometer. And when right. it hits that, take it right off the heat, pour it in lines on it and pack the snow down if you can. Uh, so uh, pack snow will just work better. And then, yeah, it's really fun and it's delicious. Sharon has a question. Where can we purchase your syrup and when's the best time to purchase? Can you explain the difference also between organic and regular maple syrup? Sure. Um, so the best place to purchase our syrup is right here at Parker's in Mason, New Hampshire. We, uh, we, we just, we're not a large enough producer where you're going to find our, our syrup in the supermarkets. A, a couple local uh, small stores we sell our syrup to, but mostly we have people that just that come here. So it's, 
it's a lot of extra work to build a distribution network and get your syrup everywhere when we've got people that want to just come into our shop and buy it so that's how we that's how we operate um really any time of year maple syrup once we produce it um we we hot pack it into stainless steel drums 40 gallon drums and once it's put into that drum it and sealed it can sit in that drum for a long long time it's not something that is going to rapidly uh, go go stale or mold or ferment once you so when you buy a jug of syrup from us it's been that that package that it's in has also been packaged at a very high temperature so that it basically seals that container and i have a friend that when it, um he, when he, uh, his, his, when his folks moved he went into their house to clean out and he found a couple of gallons of maple syrup that he remembered as a child going and buying with his parents it was 52 years ago so i said let's open it and we opened that syrup and it tasted just as good as any syrup that we were making today and it had been in that jug for 50 years because the jug was sealed yeah. i have news for you you can't say the same thing about every wine bottle that you find in the cellar either <laughs> that's true that's very true so and, and so as far as the best time to buy syrup, i mean we will we're going to start boiling probably tomorrow so i mean if you want syrup that is just off fresh off the fire um i'm not sure i'll actually have it bottled tomorrow but any syrup that we're going to have coming over the next couple of weeks is going to be as fresh as you can get it. Oh, wow. And and what about the uh, second part of that, which was, uh, the, is there a difference between organic and oh. regular? Um, so there are, where our trees are in other people's property, I have no control over anything that they, they could be using for, you know, lawn fertilizers or anything, any kind of chemicals that they might be putting in their property. But there are producers that may have a, an orchard that is all on their property where you know it's all in the woods and they they can certify that they're not using any kind of chemicals to fertilize the trees so that's really the difference but if, so if, but we don't there's no additives there's no preservatives in the syrup that we produce basically any pure maple syrup out there there isn't a need for that so that's pretty much the difference okay um one of our attendees is asking can the sap or syrup be contaminated by bad soil you know, I'm, I'm not certain, but if there is anything that's in the soil, if someone were to, let's say, um, the trees out in the woods where someone had an old car and that car was leaking fluids into the soil, that tree will pull some of that, th those chemicals into the roots and it definitely could uh, affect the quality of the sap. So yeah, that would be something to be concerned of. Okay. Concerned about. Uh, another of our attendees asks, can you overcook sap? you can um basically there's different levels so you you okay so you when you get to the point of maple syrup uh, if you cook it even just a couple degrees beyond the 221 degrees fahrenheit let's say and you put that syrup into a bottle what's going to happen is it's going to crystallize it really has to be about 67 percent sugar to be considered maple syrup we use a hydrometer which is an instrument that measures specific gravity people also use a hydrometer to measure uh, the alcohol content of wine or beer if they're making wine or beer um so we that tool we use it because we're selling to the public so we make sure it's exactly the right specific gravity before we bottle it but at home if let's say you went just a little bit over and you put that syrup into a mason jar what will happen over the coming months is you'll see ice crystals i mean not ice, sugar crystals that look like rock candy kind of growing along the, um, the edges of the bottle. That just means you took a little bit too much liquid out by heating it to a, a higher temperature. And basically you'll end up with uh, maple syrup that is just gonna crystallize on you. Okay, so I hope that answered your question. Boy, I'm learning so much about maple <laughs> syrup. Um, Dana has a question for you. She said, uh, why did New Hampshire change the grading system a few years ago? I love grade B or the darkest, best flavor in her opinion. It's really the, the Canada regulates the maple industry. And there was a decision that was not really, it wasn't a New Hampshire decision. It was, this is the, the way we're, that we're going to start grading syrup and everybody just kind of had to go along with it and it has been very confusing for people there was always there was a grade a syrup and it was grade b syrup you had grade a light grade a medium grade a dark and then you had grade b where now it's all grade a and i'm sure it was more of a marketing ploy you know we don't want anyone to think that the grade b syrup isn't good let's just call it all grade a and so but if you're someone who really loved the old grade b you just want to purchase syrup that is now called very dark so it's called grade a very dark and um, it'll have typically it'll the label on the on the cap will have some kind of red color to it 
And that is really what we call the old grade B. We use that in all of our recipes that require maple syrup because it's very strong and has a really nice maple flavor. And um, Dana and, and all our attendees, um, I have gone on Ron's website and you actually have a, a past versus current grading yes. um, table on your website. So that's very helpful too. Yeah, we have that comparison chart so people can see what it, what it used to be called and then they can determine based on all the lines and the graphs what, what grade they want to purchase. But I'll tell you, we serve grade A dark, which is also called robust in the restaurant. That's what most people tend to like. It's, it's not as strong as the cooking grade, the old grade B, but it's a little bit darker and stronger in flavor than the amber or the medium. So um, that's usually the best middle of the road one to go with. It's called grade A dark. Okay. Uh, Mark has a question for you. He says he lived in Vermont for a half dozen years. Many friends sugared in sheds on their property. So I got to observe and I saw that some used pork fat to um, retard the boil over and some used mm -hmm. milk. Do you think one is better than another? Well, if your you know, friends that are vegans don't use the pork fat, they won't like your syrup. Uh, we, we use neither, but yes, in the old days, I've heard stories that in the roof of the sugar house, there was always a nail in one of the rafters above the evaporator and they would tie a string from the nail and put a piece of salt pork at the end of the string. That string had to hang just at the right level uh, at the top of, of the, right above the top of the pan. And if you ever were to fall asleep while you were boiling sap all night, and that sap were to start to boil over, it would just boil right over the edge of the pan and into the fire and catch fire. So as soon as that boil, those bubbles would hit the salt pork, a little bit of the fat would disperse over the bubbles and bring it all back down to liquid. So the best thing that well, we use, a, we use an organic sunflower oil and just a couple of drops of any kind of fat or oil will bring the bubbles right back down to liquid. So, but you can do, you can use the pork, you can use a little bit of milk, cream would be better because there's more fat. But if you don't want to taint the syrup with the either animal, you know, any kind of animal product, just use a, any kind of a cooking oil. Okay. Um, Sarah is with us from Texas and she has a question. Is there a lifespan for a tree to be tapped? Do trees get too old to be tapped? Really not, not too old, but really it depends on the health of the tree. So if we have a tree that we, we can just see is deteriorating and limbs are falling off and doesn't have a very strong, uh, very nice crown of leaves in the summer, we won't tap that tree anymore. It means it's probably near the end of its life. A lot of times those old maple trees are right along the road. You also get a lot of road salt that is affecting the, the health of the tree. And then you can tap a tree and there's different theories behind this, but I, I wait till a tree is 18 inches in circumference before I will put one tap on it. So for me, I just wrap my arm around a tree and if my, my fingers can touch my chest, I know I got about, I got about an 18 inch circumference tree and I will put one tap on that tree. And as a tree gets bigger, you can basically safely put one tap about every 18 inches around the, the, the trunk of a tree and not take too much sap that you would harm the tree. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, Val wants to know, does removing the sap damage the tree in any way long term? As long as you don't over tap a tree, you can definitely over tap a tree and cause stress and cause, a, you know, cause it to have a, a shortened lifespan. But the, the, the rule of thumb for me is the one every 18 inches. And I have trees, Mabel across the street here, it's such a big tree I could hang if I measured out every 18 inches I could put nine buckets on Mabel that's how big she is I never put more than three or four buckets on her each year I just I would rather I would I always I always err on the side of caution I would rather under tap a tree and then just tap more trees than put too many taps and pull too much sap from one tree in one season hmm. uh, Matt wants to know how important is it to sanitize or disinfect the drill bit for tap holes from tree to tree? Not from tree to tree, but from season to season. Um, we um, all, all of the spiles that go into the tree will get sanitized. So the, the drill bits get sanitized. All the tubing lines and the, and the spiles on the tubing need to be sanitized because bacteria will grow in, in those lines from uh, after the season's over. But um, I've never, I, I have never sanitized in between. Um, Jack has a, a follow up for you, and he says, um, you've mentioned sugar content a number of times. Uh, how do you test the sugar percentage of sap? With a, a sap hydrometer. 
So a similar instrument measures specific gravity as well. We have one that measures the finished product, the syrup hydrometer, and then we have one that measures uh, the, the sap. It's not important necessarily that you know the sugar content if you're just producing at home, but you can you can purchase a sap hydrometer for probably under $25 and you just basically put your sap in a five gallon pail or some sort of a tall cylinder. And, and then you just very gently place the hydrometer in and it will measure the specific gravity and whatever line is floating right on the surface of the sap that it, read that number and that's your percentage of sugar in that batch. Okay. Um, Kathleen wants to know, hi, Ron, thank you for your insights. How are the different grades of syrup created? Hi, Kathleen. And the, so basically the beginning of the season, the sap is sweeter. So sweeter sap means you, you don't need, um, you're gonna boil less sap to make each gallon of syrup. As the sugar content get, gets, the sugar gets eaten up by the tree, as the season goes on, you get sap that is progressively less sweet. So it takes more gallons of that sap. So at the beginning, if you have sap that's sweeter, you don't have to cook it as long as well because it's gonna become syrup sooner because there's more sugar in it, even though it's a small, a small percentage of sugar. So you end up with the lighter, the lighter grade or the lighter colored syrup at the beginning of the season. And then as the season goes on, you have to cook the sap longer and longer and it gets progressively darker in color and stronger in maple flavor. Okay. Um, am I saying this right? Spile? Does that? Spile. Sound? Yeah. Okay. So Laurie wants to know if, tra if sap is running through the spile, but also down the side of the tree, is the spile not positioned correctly? It could be that you use the wrong size drill bit. That's a possibility. Or you have to be very gentle when you're, when you're tapping the tree. You wanna make sure you go in very straight and come out very straight. You don't wanna move the drill bit up or you know, the drill up or down because what'll happen is you will make the hole oblong. And if the hole isn't perfectly round and the right size drill bit for that spile to fit in and seal that, um, that the perimeter of that hole that you've drilled, you will get some seepage out of that hole. So that might be what's happening is the, or if you hammer it in too hard, the force of that spile going into the tree will actually crack the bark above and below the spile and cause sap to leak there too. It won't, you're not hurting the tree necessarily, but you're going to get less sap in your bucket. Okay. Um, Casey's with us from Connecticut and uh, she asked, could you tap the sunny side or should you tap the sunny side of the tree? Yes. Um, there, there's been different theories behind this as well, that it's better to tap on the southern side um, or you stay away from the northern side. I, I test it from year to year. And sometimes it really just depends on the temperature. When you have warmer days and you've, you've got taps on the north side, those taps are running. You might get a little less sap out of that side. But yeah, the side of the tree that's going to be in the sun the longest period of time is that's going to be the side that's going to most likely run the best for you. Okay. Uh, what state, uh, Carol Lynn wants to know, what state produces the most maple syrup? And uh, what is the difference between the different grades of maple syrup? I think we carried, uh, we've, we've covered yeah. that one, but what state produces the most maple syrup? Vermont. Okay. You know, Canada, of course, the, the biggest producer in the world, and then Vermont would be the biggest uh, U.S. producer. Okay. And I wish I could tell you exactly how many gallons, but um, the, the Vermont is really takes the lead over all other New England states. I traveled to um, Alaska about 10 years ago, and I saw bottles of what looked like maple syrup. And I got closer and it didn't say maple, it said birch. Mm -hmm. And I asked the store clerk, I said, okay, tell me about this. And they said, we can't grow maple trees here in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So we tap birch and I said, how does it taste? And she said, you have to buy a bottle and find out. <laughs> did you? So I did. And I got to tell you, it's practically the same product. Um, wow. It really, it, I, I actually have a bottle in my fridge right now. It looks the same. It mm -hmm. flows the same when you pour it. Uh, but it's, um, you know. You have to understand that I'm a New England girl, so I, my heart is with the maple stuff. Right. Yeah. There are some, there are, not, there's not a lot of uh, birch syrup producers in the area, but there are some people that I know of that do tap uh, the birch trees. So the birch season Here? comes. Yeah, yeah, there are. Yeah, if you have birch trees, you could tap them. The season tends to come uh, in a couple of weeks that follow sugar season. 
uh, that for whatever reason, those trees just run a little bit later and you can you can tap them just like a maple tree and gather that sap and boil it. Um, I don't know all of the details of the process and I have yet to taste it, but I have someone locally who has a large tract of land covered in birch trees and he's interested in seeing if I would after sugar season start producing birch sap for him and I'm not sure I have time for that at this point, but eh, it's it's something maybe in the future if there's a market for it. All right. Well, um, let's take just a, a quick moment here. Uh, thank you so much for these wonderful questions, folks, and, and keep them coming. We've got we've got more time to answer them. Um, I would like to take a moment right now, though, uh, to introduce my colleague, Mark. Welcome, Mark. I'm Mark Cohen from GBH's on-air fundraising team. We're glad you could join us for this afternoon's Ask the Expert Sap to Syrup event. You know, just like tasting a spoonful of maple syrup, there's something so sweet about a community of people brought together by tapping season and maple sugaring. GBH relies on financial support from members to keep offering free virtual programs just like this one. Today, if you decide to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you'll receive the book Backyard Sugaring by Rink Man as our way of saying thanks. This is a complete how-to guide on how to make your own maple syrup at home. As a GBH sustainer, you pick a monthly amount that works for you and your budget. It's automatically deducted from your bank account or charged to your credit card, and you can make a change to that amount anytime you wish. And given to GBH, it's simple and secure. There's three ways to make a donation. First, you can visit gbh.org slash support events. The link for that can be seen in the chat tab now, or you could send a text to 800-204 3811 using the keyword GBH to make the donation, or go ahead, scan the QR code right here on the screen, and that'll open up a, do a donation form on your smartphone or device. Every dollar makes a difference, and GBH is here for you because listeners and viewers have stepped up and made the choice to give. Please join them by giving right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We really appreciate that. And we do appreciate our radio listeners, our TV viewers, and all who choose to become members of the GBH Foundation. You're not just members, you're, you're members of our family, keeping this wonderful, wonderful thing going. And um, as Mark uh, just said also, um, you know, that it is that we rely on you to keep going as well. And Ron, you're a family business. You understand about family pitching in. Sure, absolutely. Um, Dana had a follow-up question to uh, her earlier question. She said, I was told old syrup should be boiled again to make sure there's no bacteria. Is that true? I guess it depends on where you had that old syrup. If you typically, um, when you buy a jug of syrup, you can buy it off of our shelf, put it in your pantry, if it's unopened, you could leave it there for many, many years. Like my friend Dave, 50 years later, it was still good. But once you open, once you crack the lid and you let air contact the syrup, then it needs to be refrigerated. And um, it's very unlikely that it's ever going to grow any mold in the refrigerator. What could happen is it could, um, water could evaporate from it if you don't keep the cover on tight. So you might have it in there for a long time and you'll start to see those ice crystals form. I mean, not ice, <laughs> the rock the rock candy crystals. But as far as reboiling it, the only time you'd want to do that is if you left it in your pantry, you opened it, you put it back in there because you, you didn't want to keep it cold. You wanted it to be warm. Um, you might find mold on the top. What you would do is you wouldn't want to throw it away. You could pour that syrup into a stainless steel pot on your stove. Just bring it to a boil. That little bit of mold it would only be on the surface. It'll it'll rise to the top of the bubbles, just skim off the mold. And then you can put that syrup once it cools down back into a clean container. Okay. And it's, it should be good. That's that sounds like all of us are frugal New Englanders, too. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to throw away maple syrup. It's too, it's too expensive and too delicious. That's right. Um, so one of our attendees is asking, are you saying that my Japanese maple can be tapped? Sure. I have yet to tap a Japanese maple because I don't see many of those out there when I'm, when I'm out and about. But yeah, any maple tree can be tapped. Okay. Uh, another attendee is asking, uh, Ron, would you please give us a brief overview of the whole maple syrup making process, since we're not all familiar with it? So let's let's sure. do the let's do the abbreviated all right. version. So you go out and you you tap the tree. So if you are going to do this at home, go get yourself a couple of a maple buckets. Sometimes you can pick those up at a hardware store. I could 
I could even set you up with a couple here. And you need, so you need maple buckets, you need a lid to keep out rain and snow, and you need a spile to be able to put into that tree in the right size drill bit. Once the sap is in that bucket, you would then put that sap into a stainless steel pot. You can do it outside, like on a turkey, like think of a turkey fryer. You could get that base that you would be outdoors frying your turkey in, but you use that base with, with the gas flame and put that stainless steel pot filled with sap. Boil that, fill that pot to the top and boil it down until you've got just a few inches of what is almost maple syrup. Take that little bit of maple syrup out and then put it into a separate container. Now you can rinse that pot out and refill it with sap and go through that process again and again. Take all that super concentrated sap that is left at the bottom of each one of those boil times. And then once you've got enough of that, put that into that pot and then you would finish that almost finished sap down till it's maple syrup. That's pretty much the, the, the process there. It's just a matter of you're just boiling water. You're boiling the sap and removing the water till it reaches the right sugar concentration. It's really pretty simple process. Wow. All right. So Ruby is in Boston and says, I have a sugar maple that's five stories high and maybe 400 years old. Someone made it, uh, screwed up and amputated all the boughs and branches all the way up to the second story. Uh, sad, but given my location and the state of the tree, do you think it's possible to tap it and have any useful amount of sap? And would it be harmful to this tree to do so? I guess I'd be curious to know how long ago they cut all the limbs off. If it was recently, you might even get some seepage from all of those severed limbs uh, during this season. The reality, yeah, you could, you could still tap it. Um, that, a, a few taps on a tree like that is not going to harm it any further. I mean, if the tree has any serious damage, any large holes in it or um, broken broken um, sections of the tree, you might want to stay away from it. But putting a few buckets on that probably probably wouldn't harm it any further. Uh, Priscilla wants to know how is maple sugar candy made and do you make it at Parker's Maple Barn? Yeah, so basically um, maple sugar candy is made by taking maple syrup. You typically want to make maple candy, maple cream, or maple sugar with the lightest syrup that, that comes at the beginning of the season because you're gonna take that syrup and now you're gonna cook it further. If you start off with that grade B syrup that uh, they used to, used to have, uh, and you start boiling that further, by the time you turn it into candy, it's gonna be, it's gonna be very, very dark brown and be very smoky, it's not gonna taste good. So you always start with the lightest syrup and you basically, you just heat the, the product to different temperatures. So maple candy, you go about 32 degrees above the boiling point of water. So you, once you hit that temperature, you then will, you're gonna whip up the, the syrup and then you're going to pour it into candy molds and then when that syrup cools rather than it cooling and just staying as a syrup it's going to cool and harden and turn into little pieces of maple candy to make maple cream you go a little bit less you go about 24 degrees above the boiling point of water and then add air by whipping it up and then you now you pour that syrup into you know, glass jars mason jars and that is going to then it's going to get soft, but it's not going to turn into rock hard candy. It's going to be soft and spreadable, kind of like peanut butter. So it's really, it's one product that you just boil to different levels of sugar concentration to make the different maple products. If you want to make maple sugar, you, you remove most of the water. You go about 45 to 50 degrees above the boiling point of water. And then you have to really whip it really fast and it will just crystallize and turn into almost like powdered maple sugar. It's pretty neat. I've, I've used that actually in my baking. It's mm -hmm. so, so good. Everything you just described, so good. Mm -hmm. um, so question from Willa, did I miss this? What do you do about the holes at the end of the season? Do you tap the same spot each year? We do not. We let those holes heal. So we pull the spiles out at the end of the season. We know when the season's over, the buds the little red things at the tips of every branch that are going to eventually become leaves, you can really see them standing on the ground and looking at the top of a tree. You can kind of see when the buds have sprouted. They just, on the red maples, they almost turn into like a red, almost like a little flower. But once the, once the trees bud out, the sap will then begin to turn a little bit um, sour or it'll get, it'll get an off color to it. But um, so we, we then pull the spiles. Those holes have already started to heal. After about six weeks of drilling a hole in a maple tree, it's already starting to heal itself. So we pull those spiles out and usually within, within one year, that, that hole that we drilled this year will, will be completely healed over if you use a small enough spout. 
spile. So um, yeah, so we never tap in that same spot again. We always find a new place to put a new hole and all the old holes heal over. It's kind of neat. Uh, one of our attendees asks, did Native Americans in this area collect maple sap? Yeah, Native Americans were the first people to make maple syrup and they taught all of the settlers that, how to make it. So it was, you know, there was a time when um, back in Ben Franklin's time that there were plans to make the U.S. self-sufficient in sugar production, but using maple sugar instead of cane sugar. And that never came to fruition, but, but um, it was definitely the Native Americans who were the first ones that were making the maple syrup. And they would, they would actually hollow out a log and they would char the insides to seal up all the pores in the wood and they would fill that hollowed out log with the sap and then they'd start a large fire, put rocks into the fire and then put those red hot rocks into the sap and that's how they boiled the water out of the sap. And they would just boil all the water out, turn it into maple blocks of like maple sugar and then they could store that you know, through the long winters. Fran is with, Fran is, oh, I'm sorry. You wanna finish your thought? I'm good. Okay, um, so Fran is with us from Nashua, New Hampshire, and asks if there are big gaps in the sap running, is the quality of the sap affected? No, there isn't. Um, so yeah, we do. This does happen where right, right now we've had a, a few days of very warm weather, so the sap is really running. But then tonight it's supposed to go down, you know, in this area about 14 degrees. The next few days and nights are going to be perfect sugaring weather, days up into the 30s and 40s, nights in the 20s. But then I want to say Monday or Tuesday, I saw that it's going to hit 55 again. So, but we do sometimes get what we call just a freeze where everything would just get hit with a cold snap. And even though we were making lots of syrup and the sap was running like crazy one week, you might get a full week where it just, everything freezes up solid and nothing runs. It is, it, there's no difference really. It doesn't affect anything. It's just once the weather warms up again, the trees will start to move the sap up from the roots again. Okay, um, let's see. I think we've answered that question. Um, oh, uh, Casey wants to know what happens if you accidentally tap a tree that's not actually a maple? Well, that hole will heal. That tree will heal itself over just like any other tree. Um, yeah, I mean, other trees are producing sap, but the sap just won't have a lot of sweetness to it. And I've never actually tried to boil sap from any other tree, but I have had times in the past where I've, I've, I've sent a crew out tapping and I come to check on them. And there's this one tree that's amongst all the maples that isn't a maple, but it almost looked like it could be a maple. So it's happened where other trees have been tapped, but we just uh, will take the bucket uh, off of that tree because it's not a maple and just let it heal. Uh, Priscilla wants to know what part of the process is open for visiting by the public at your site? Uh, we the boiling process. So we offer tours to the public starting uh, for, uh, uh, the 1st of March. I'm not sure what day the 1st of March is this year, but typically weekends in March, I should say, is where we open our sugar house. We have tour guides that will walk you through and you can watch the syrup being boiled. If we have, if we have sap to boil, we, you can watch the whole process and watch the trucks back in with the sap, the raw product. So we show, you, we show you what the raw product looks like, tell you about the history of maple sugaring and bring you through the whole process and you can see the finished product coming off. And it's, of course, it's always weather dependent and sap dependent, but typically in March, most weekends, we, we do have sap to boil. Fun. Um, I, I actually remember going to, it was a day trip. My, my parents threw us in the back of the car and, and we took off. I don't remember where. I just remember going and loving the whole thing. And we got to put our finger in the sap and yeah. tasted it. And it tasted like sweet water. It, it was a surprise to me that it didn't come out as yeah. syrup from the tree. Yeah, it surprises a lot of people. And um, yeah, it really does. It looks exactly like water. It tastes like water. Um, with just a little hint of sweetness. It doesn't necessarily taste like maple. It's right. the cooking process. It's the caramelization of the sugar with the heat of the fire that brings that maple flavor uh, out of the sap. Uh, Ellen wants to know, when we freeze syrup, it sometimes gets hard sugar on the sides of the jar. Why is that? That would typically, you can freeze syrup if it's the right concentration, 67% sugar, it shouldn't crystallize, freezing won't cause that, but it might be that syrup that was maybe just a little bit over density, so that sugar was going to form anyway, so that it sounds like that's what it is, and if that happens, what you can do is you can pour that syrup into a stainless steel pot, get some really hot water, but not a lot of it, 
uh, maybe like heat it up in the tea kettle, put a little bit of that hot water in and just move the jug around to break up all that sugar and then add that to the syrup, bring it all to just about to a boil and shut it right off. So you're, you're, you're kind of melting down the sugar that's there. You've added a little bit of extra water that was missing from that syrup and it's still gonna be a good quality maple syrup. Okay, um, David would like to know, uh, my hydrometer has a hot test line at 211 degrees. If I boil to 221, do I have to wait until it cools to 211 to use the hydrometer? Well, there is a chart available um, that would make it make your life a lot easier. I'm surprised that you, you didn't get one with the hydrometer. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to get a hold of that chart online, but I have a copy of the chart that I would be happy if he if we wanted to give my information to him. Uh, it would basically, um, you know, the chart will tell you what at what temperature your syrup is, exactly what the hydrometer should read. So I, it's a BRICS chart. So I would need to, he would need to get his hands on a BRICS chart. He might be able to Google that term and find one online actually. Okay. Um, Jack asks, you mentioned sanitizing your spiles. Um, and drill bits, how do you sanitize? Is boiling that equipment for a few minutes sufficient? We use a food service sanitizer. Um, boiling, I mean, yeah, you could, you could boil spiles. You could certainly do that. I actually use a plastic spile. Um, the, the old spiles we used in the old days were much larger. They required a 7 16 drill bit. And it was a drill bit that basically you could stick your pinky finger into the hole in the tree when you were done. And, it, you, you got a good amount of sap from the holes, but it took the tree sometimes two full years to completely heal over. So they've come a long way with the technology and the spiles are much smaller. They found you can put a, a 1964 size hole into a tree and get just as much sap from the same hole and the tree can heal itself over in nine to 12 months. So I don't boil mine because they're made of plastic, um, but you could certainly you could certainly boil them. Yeah. Okay, Kathleen would like to know, have you ever heard of, oh, I just lost her. Have you heard, ever heard of anyone boiling the sap over a wood stove? And do you think it would affect the taste? No, well, we use a wood fire here. Uh, most sugar makers these days are using either a gas fire, an oil fire evaporator. It's more efficient. It's, you don't have to constantly stoke the fire, but we just continue to do things the old fashioned way because we're also about educating the public, letting the, letting the school groups come through and to see the, the, the fire getting filled with wood is just, um, we just like to do it old fashioned. But yeah, you could definitely do it on a wood stove. I'm not sure you want to do it in your house on a wood stove. I have friends that did that and it took the wallpaper off all the walls in the living room because all the steam that was produced. Um, yeah, the wallpaper started. So I said, well, you should have done that in the backyard on an old wood stove. But yeah, outside, some people do set up a, a wood stove and they will boil right on that wood stove. But an open fire, you'll get a little more contact. You want contact from the flames to hit the bottom of your pan. So um, an open fire is, is better. Uh, Jay wants to know, how deep do you put the tap into the tree? Just a little over an inch deep is, is, um, is all we're going in. About an inch, inch and a quarter is how deep we drill the hole. Yeah, the, the spile, you only have to break through. You, the, the sugar maples tend to have a very thick outer bark. And then there's an inner bark that's just behind the outer bark. And then the next layer behind that is the cambium layer. And that's where the sap flows through the cambium layer. So you really just have to break through that cambium layer to get the sap to flow, but you have to put the spile in deep enough to hold the weight of a, well, if it's tubing, you don't have to go as deep. But with us, with a maple bucket that we use, it holds three gallons of sap, the old fashioned buckets. And um, that's about 24 pounds of sap. So if the spile isn't in deep enough, once it gets about half full, the spile would just pull right out of the tree. So. Yeah, the depth isn't as important. It just has to go in enough so that your spile will be in there firm to hold the weight of the bucket. Um, one of our attendees wants to know, so good to know about what to do about the mold as once mine did grow mold and I just threw it out. Now I know what to do and that's a thank you. You're um, so um, Sharon says, when I was growing up, any syrup we had removed from the jug in the fridge was then put in a different container. Do you remember this? So the only 
I'm not sure about that. So what we do at home is we take the jug out of the refrigerator. We put it into like a, a handmade little um, syrup pitcher that my daughter made. And, um, and then from there, we can microwave it to get it warm. I mean, some people will pour cold syrup directly from the fridge out of the jug right onto their pancakes, but it will chill, chill out your pancakes. So warming it up in any kind of a little pitcher or even a, like a, a cream pitcher or even a coffee mug, just warm it up in the microwave for even you know, 15, 20 seconds. So you're pouring warm syrup onto your pancakes, but there's no reason to take that jug of syrup that you would buy from us and move it into any other container. Um, Sharon wants to know, what about storage? Uh, is it better on a shelf or in the fridge? Unopened on the shelf, once it's opened in the fridge for sure. Okay. Um, and let's see, who have we not asked yet? Um, uh, one of our attendees asks about nutritionally speaking, does maple sugar have any health benefits that make it preferable to use over cane sugar? I say yes. Uh, there, are, there, are, there have been lots of studies found that there, there's a lot of minerals and amino acids in maple sap. So, so there is a lot of health benefits. A lot of people are, you know, they're now even packaging maple sap. They're just extracting sap from the trees and there's a market for kind of like coconut water. Um, mm -hmm. So they're just packaging basically sap that's probably just been filtered. And, um, but, and then when in the cooking process, those minerals are still there. It's just, um, they're getting, they're getting kind of cooked and caramelized and burnt a little bit, but there's definitely, I, I couldn't tell you all the different health benefits of maple syrup, but if you, if you were to look it up on the internet, you'll find that there's definitely uh, many, many health benefits over maple, you know, over cane syrup, uh, high fructose corn syrups or any cane sugars. Uh, well, we have time for one more question. And, and this one from Walter has come up and he asks, and I think he's getting excited by all this maple sugar talk. He says, is it too late for me to try tapping a maple tree this year? No, do it today. Yay. I'm still going to be tapping trees today. I'm not even done yet. So no, you're, you're good. I love that. Ron, yeah. thank, you. thank you so much. I, I have okay. learned more about maple syrup in this hour than I did my whole life. And I, I read books about every ingredient you can find. <laughs> I love reading books about ingredients. So, so this has been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we do want folks to know that you do have a restaurant as well as a gift shop, as well as the Sugar Shack. And uh, they can find out all about these things on your website. Can you give the website for us? Yeah, it's parkersmaplebarn.com. And Parker's does not have a, a apostrophe. No, no one, apostrophe, one all one word. Yeah. Right. And, and I'm telling you, you're going to love the site. You're not going to want to get off it just like I did. Ron, thank you again. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank everybody. Me. Everybody who's with us today, um, thank you for joining us. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to every question, but I hope we covered enough so that you know the process and the, the fun and the wonderful res, uh, results, the rewards for doing all that work. And I uh, want to say also thank you to the team behind the scenes, the crew that have been helping us today. And uh, thank you, finally, for supporting the GBH Foundation. Till the next time.